This program is brought to you by Stanford Hospital and Clinics. Hi, my name is Yann Meunier. I'm the Director of International Corporate Affairs and Business Development for Stanford Hospital and Clinics. And our guest today is Joyce Hanna. She is the Associate Director of the Stanford Health Improvement Program, which is part of the Stanford Prevention Research Center. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Anne. How are you today? I'm fine, thank Good. you. It's a pleasure to be here with mm -hmm. you. Uh, 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 Joyce, please tell us what is the latest on inactivity in the work workplace? What does the science tell us today? Well, basically the science is telling us that we are sitting too much. Uh, we sit more than any previous generation in, in, in the country ever. And um, previously we thought, and it's still true, that when we sit a lot, we use less calories and it doesn't help with our weight man uh, management uh, program. But now we know it does even more than um, impacting the number of calories that we burn. And there's been some research out, it's preliminary research, but it's catching people's eyes, that when you sit a lot, things happen um, at a cellular level in your body. Our bodies were really meant to move, and when we sit like for six hours, which many of us do now, Yan, in front of the computer without even realizing it, that we're just, we're just stuck there, um, or else doing other sorts of bits of technology, and we're not using our muscles at all, things change at a metabolic level. So it not only keeps us more sedentary not, and not having the benefit of physical activity, but some of the research is even showing that it increases our uh, risk for disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, even if you exercise during, at other times during the day. So that's a surprising thing. And this is just pre preliminary uh, research. It's not um, been replicated yet, but it is taking people's interest. So. so you had an anecdote you told me uh, a few weeks ago about the group of people who were training for the marathon, mm -hmm. and some people would rest after the practice, mm -hmm. and others would keep active. Yes. And what were the differences? Well, uh, actually, it was, it was a uh, very surprising result that they found out that many people who were running ma marathons were not actually, uh, they were training for marathons, they were not actually burning up that many calories, and they couldn't figure that out until they realize that after you've been tra training hard, you tend to kind of loll around a bit during the day, and you do sit and lie down a little bit more, particularly if you've been exercising hard. It's a, it's a natural thing to do. But the accumulation of these calories that we spend a little bit all through the day do count, and uh, they're important for us to keep our activity up during the day. So what can people do during the day, especially in the workplace, mm -hmm. to keep active? There is so much we can do. I like to say that the main thing we need to do is to beware of the chair. We need to get out of the chair. And as I said before, we sit an awful lot in our, uh, this generation does. And then it's only gonna get worse with the technological advances. So anytime you can get out of the chair, and I have some lots of ideas on things you can do. Sometimes people set um, their smartphone to ring every 30, uh, 30 minutes and they get up from the chair and do something. They go to the printer, they go to the fax machine, they go to the restroom, and just that helps a lot. And it keeps the muscles activated so you don't get that um, metabolic change. And there's a lot of other things you can do um, as far as uh, keeping active right in your office. For example, can you, like if you uh, sit on a, on a ball, mm -hmm. those rubber ball, rather than a chair, would that yeah, that, that's kind of come back into vogue. People were sitting on these balls, I think about 10 years ago, and it was quite the thing in the gyms. But now they've come back because uh, it does uh, keep some tension in your muscles so that you're not just sitting on the chair. In order to keep balanced on the ball, you need to use your muscles. So that gets rid of that uh, metabolic effect that happens when you're just sitting there. But I think the most important thing you could do in the workplace, um, in your office, is to take the stairs. And if you, are if you are lucky enough to live, some, uh, live someplace, that too, but to work someplace where there's chair, uh, stairs, it's really important to use them. And I'm not just talking about when you uh, get into the uh, building and walking up to your office. I'm talking throughout the day when you take your break. Climb up a couple of flights of stairs and just make sure that you uh, tuck in your abs and uh, keep your uh, shoulders relaxed. And you can um, go up one flight putting your whole foot on the chair, on the stair, and then the next flight, try skipping a chair, uh, stair, and going up that flight. 
And if you live in a building in which uh, your office is on the eighth floor and you don't feel like climbing up uh, eight flights of, of uh, stairs, take the elevator up to four and then climb four uh, flights or uh, kind of mix and match so that you get those that stair climbing in. What about the email? I mean, people are sending email to the, the na na next door neighbor. And right. whether, uh, Yes, that's, that's a habit we've all gotten into, and uh, it's a hard one to break. But um, there was a study done actually some time ago on this that if you actually got up and instead of sending an email for two minutes and you walked to that person and gave them the message and then walked back for two minutes for every hour on an eight-hour work week, uh, eight-hour day, 40-hour work week, over 10 years, you would have a difference of 10 pounds. Now, that might not seem very much, but that is just one tiny activity. So if you multiply that many, many times, you could have a huge impact on your weight. What about uh, sending the mail, for example? So sorting the mail? Yeah, well, you know, when you have some mail, instead of giving it, putting it in the box, just going there. Walk, yeah. You Anytime know. you can get up and, uh, you know, another thing you can do is even if you don't have something to do, uh, lap around the office a couple times. Uh, mm -hmm. Smile at a few people, say hello to a few people. And if you feel self-conscious doing that, you could put a folder in your hand so people were thinking that you were going to a very important meeting and um, just uh, take a couple laps around the office. Also, are there some stretching exercises that people yeah. can do? When they, yeah. yeah, there are lots of good stretching exercises, uh, particularly at the end of the day or when you had that afternoon slump. It's uh, good to kind of stretch your shoulders out. And one really good exercise for your back is to clasp your arms behind you and um, clasp your hands with your arms behind you and raise your arms as, as high as you can do. And if you want to make it a little more difficult is keep your palms together and you want to breathe deeply in that exercise and not arch your back. And that's a wonderful release for the, uh, for the shoulders and for the upper, upper back. Um, so that's, that's important to do because we get very tense sitting. And, um, you know, another thing you can do, um, if you don't happen to have stairs, if you want to exercise those quads and keep your legs strong, because the quads are almost the, one of the most important muscles in our body, uh, we have to use them to walk is to um, go up to the side of the wall and sit, sit on the wall, sit, make, make an, an invisible chair for yourself and slide down uh, um, the, the wall with your back until your quads are parallel to the floor and keep your knees right over your feet, just like you're sitting in a chair and see how long you can sit there. And I think a lot of people will be surprised that this is a hard exercise. And, you know, you can time yourself, see how many seconds you can sit there and see if you can work up to one minute. And that is a wonderful, wonderful exercise that you can do right in your own office and take less than a minute. What about breathing exercising? Would that be also relaxing in terms Certainly. of relieving the stress? Yeah. And Most of us have a certain amount of stress and tension in our work and uh, any kind of breathing that you can do. Uh, the uh, belly breathing, which a lot of people have heard about, I find that we've all heard about belly breathing, but we don't do it. And uh, all you have to do is just to concentrate on uh, inhaling and having your belly expand while you're inhaling, so you're, when your diaphragm is going down, and just take a deep breath in and out. And just two or three of those can really reduce the stress and tension in your body. It can be quite, quite effective. And burn, and burn some calories at the same time. Yeah. Of course, yeah. So are there some websites that people could go to in terms of uh, learning those exercises? For well, uh, there's just tons of resources available. Uh, the American College of uh, American College of Sports Medicine, ACSM.org, is kind of the gold standard of our organization. And those of us in the exercise physiology field are all certified at that uh, website. And they are the ones that actually help set out the, uh, the uh, goals for us. They were very um, prominent in setting out the fact that we should all exercise at a moderate level, 30 minutes a day, and then do some also some muscular um, strength exercises too, at least two times a day. So uh, that's a good website to start at. at. And then they, can, uh, they, ha they have some links to some other ones too. Yeah. And what are the benefits that people can expect from exercising like this? Well, uh, you know, exercise is kind of the magic pill now. Uh, I've been in this field for a while, and when I first became an exercise physiologist, we would have to convince people to exercise, and there were actually people who did not believe that it was going to be helpful. And now, 
even though people don't all exercise, um, uh, even though more are, but everyone, I think, agrees that exercise is beneficial on many, many, many levels, certainly for cardiovascular disease, um, for keeping you less uh, stiff, um, like uh, we were talking about before, Ian, on uh, reducing uh, pain from arthritis. Actually, it seems a little counterintuitive, but you need to exercise if you have arthritis. And the research is showing that um, exercise does uh, not eliminate, but help reduce the risk for three cancers, colon, uh, breast, and prostate cancer. And uh, research is also now showing that when after you've had cancer, exercise can help uh, decrease the recurrence of cancer and increase the survival rate. Mm -hmm. And of course, diabetes is a big disease in our country right now, and it can help reduce your risk for diabetes, not to mention um, keeping uh, the risk for obesity down. Mm -hmm. So, and also some uh, stref, stress relief, uh, better sleep, uh, less anxiety, yeah. Yeah. those types yeah. of things. Yeah, it increases um, definitely the quality of sleep. And uh, there's been tons of research out that it actually, uh, in increasing self-esteem, of course, but also in uh, relieving depression. And I know therapists uh, frequently recommend to their uh, patients that they need to get out and, and walk to relieve that sort of um, down feeling that they have. It's almost one of the first things that's recommended. So. so in your experience, I mean, your vast experience, what would be the main motivator for them, for people to, uh, to exercise? Would be... I, I think everyone's got to get their own motivator. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are motivated by uh, when they get a scare, like they have a heart incident and their family has had heart disease, they can get, they get a scare and they don't want to have that happen to them. That can be a motivator. Um, weight, of course, is a big issue in our country. That can be a motivator. I do think, though, one of the best motivators is, is that how you feel about yourself uh, when you start doing something that, quote, you kind of know you should be doing. Um, you will feel more energetic. You will feel um, more clear in your mind. You will have that good, that endorphins, those uh, good, good feeling um, hormones that, that rise when you exercise. And I think getting um, softly addicted to those sort of things can really motivate you to exercise. So you go out and exercise so you can feel good. And there, there's nothing more motivating than feeling good. So last but not least, this implies a behavior change. Yeah, it does. And behavior yeah. change has been studied here at Stanford. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a program and there's a science behind that. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. And um, actually, we use at our, in our program um, some psychology from Bandura, who is a psychologist here at Stanford. Social learning theory sounds very, very um, um, educational and erudite, and it, it is. But it basically, when you distill it down, it is just setting short-term, reasonable behavioral goals. And to put that into language, if someone were coming to me and they were trying to get started on an exercise program, the first thing I would ask them is what they're doing now. And if they're not doing anything, even though they would like to say, I'm, I'm walking five days a week, um, they're, they're not. So they say that. And then we, we, we work out a goal of what would be based on what they're doing now. So the goal would not be, well, let's walk five days a week. Uh, we would say, well, you've only, you haven't been exercising at all, so do you think we could do one day a week? And sometimes people would say, well, I can do more than that. Well, let's just start out with one so that you actually have success doing it, and that builds your self-esteem in doing more. And let's, um, let's, let's again, uh, make it behavioral so we can measure it. And, um, we, and, we, and we will measure it, and then, then we can increase that short-term goal to something a little bit more. But I think the key is not getting carried away uh, and setting grandiose, unattainable goals. Um, you know, uh, random, great, uh, g g um, grandiose goals frequently meet with, with uh, grandiose defeat. Mm -hmm. So uh, we like people to be successful. But behind this uh, realistic uh, goal setting, there mm -hmm. are also psychological aspects like anticipating barriers and, yeah. and motivating yourself. Exactly. Uh, uh, yes. Well, we all have barriers when we're trying to set out doing something that we haven't done before. So we do work with people. Like, what have you, have you tried to do this before? And yes, well, what got in your way? Well, I didn't have time is a big one. Well, how could we, you know, how, how can we work together on getting some more time? Well, what other barriers do you have? Well, um, 
I don't have anyone to do it with. Well, do you think you know you could find somebody or maybe do a couple of walks on your own? So we anticipate those barriers, and uh, we also ask for um, people to get social support. Social support is so important. And if you don't have it in your family, um, which, which is a nice place to get it, but if that doesn't happen to be there for you, or perhaps you, don't, you live alone, then you can get maybe a friend to help you. And even if that friend can't walk with you, perhaps you could ask your friend how they could support you. And you could say, you know, it would really help me if you asked me every week if I took my walk. And I don't want you to be critical or to make fun of me, but just, just ask me, and that would really be supportive. So you kind of create your own support system. And rewarding yourself. Oh, for sure. You've got to reward yourself. <laughs> you know, when you're doing something like, particularly uh, when you're uh, losing weight, um, but also in exercising, you are depriving yourself a little bit. And your body sees it as a deprivation. I mean, you just have to admit it because, you know, you've been doing something else. And, and uh, it, if, you, if it was an easy change, you would have done it before. So you need to reward yourself a little bit. And I'm not talking about, you know, taking a big trip to Hawaii or something. I mean, that, that would be great if you could do that and, and do it by all means. But I'm talking about little rewards. Um, something that normally you wouldn't do, maybe buy a certain magazine, uh, get, a, get on Amazon.com, buy a couple of books that normally you wouldn't do. Anything that would be a reward to you. It doesn't matter if it would be a reward to somebody else. And I think the most important reward of all is, uh, again, what you're saying to yourself is an internal reward. And pretty soon, after you've gotten a little bit in the habit, when you're through with that exercise, you'll say to yourself, wow, wasn't that good of me to do that? I did that again. And that, that is the most motivating uh, reward you can give yourself. So. Well, thank you very much, Joyce, for this very interesting and insightful talk. Thank you, Ian. I've enjoyed it. You're welcome.